Hey again, everybody, and welcome back to another Facebook Live show here on COSA TV. I'm Greg Blanchard. Uh, wonderful to have you joining us again tonight. We've got a really interesting show uh, coming up, and we'll meet our guest uh, tonight in just a few moments. Uh, on terms of uh, reopening of businesses, uh, especially here in the province of Ontario, some uh, better news uh, coming out here in recent days. I know uh, there is optimism for hopefully a return to racing in the next uh, maybe two or three weeks if all goes well and we get the green light from government and getting more positive uh, signs as we hear uh, things like golf courses and uh, outdoor recreational centers are getting set to open. That's great news. But uh, today, a draft report out in the media uh, talking about phase one of the three-phase reopening plan set out by the uh, provincial government and it was great to see horse racing mentioned specifically in that. So more uh, reasons for optimism, and uh, we certainly hope that continues uh, here in the next few days. But as mentioned, we have uh, a wonderful show set to come out your way here tonight on COSA TV's Facebook Live platform, and we will have it for you coming up on the other side. And welcome back uh, live uh, again. Uh, welcome to everybody tuning in uh, tonight. And uh, we certainly hope to hear from you this evening. If you're watching on the Facebook platform, leave your comments and questions for our guests tonight. We've got a really interesting panel, three uh, gentlemen who are uh, heavily involved in horse ownership, among other things, Adriano Sorella and Rob Giles from here in Ontario. Jeff Davis joining us tonight from Illinois. And we'll get to those uh, gentlemen in just a moment. Uh, before we get started tonight, though, we've got a poll question right off the top. Want to give you lots of time to think about this one and submit your answers uh, to us throughout the night. And again, you can leave your answers in the comment section. We've got some trivia coming up uh, during the program as well. But our poll question, and this, this is an interesting topic. We're hearing more discussion around uh, the topic of uh, universal rules among all of the various jurisdictions in North America. It's something that seems to be getting a bit of traction. And uh, we wanted to ask you, which of the following rules would you most like to see made universal if that were to happen? Uh, the pylon rule is one option. We've given you the fair start rule as another, the urging rule or something other than that. And again, uh, please uh, play along with that. We'll check out the results during uh, the night and uh, recap the question a couple of times and have the answers for you at the end of the show. Again, welcoming our uh, three special guests tonight, Adriano Sorella, Jeff Davis, and Rob Giles. And uh, Adriano, maybe let's start with you. Uh, right off the top, uh, great to see mention of horse racing uh, today in that draft report that uh, was, was out in the media. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good news so far. It looks like uh, phase one involves all types of uh, sporting events, obviously without fans, but uh, it's a it's a good thing for for harness racing here, all of horse racing here in Ontario. So that uh, that's some positive news for us. And and uh, you know, there's a, a bunch of people that uh, need to be you know uh, applauded or congratulated because there's been a lot of people behind the scenes working hard to make sure we get horse racing going here in Ontario. Yep. Uh, your business, uh, primarily advertising, marketing. Um, just talk about the COVID-19 situation. Has it had a, a negative impact on your business like others, or have you seen uh, maybe a, a bit of opportunity in what you do? Yeah, with the, I, I deal a lot with online advertising, and, uh, and we've seen a spike in numbers. You know, obviously, a lot of people are home right now, so they're they're online, they're, they're surfing, uh, you know, at home on their mobile devices and we've seen a little bit of a spike in traffic uh, as our advertisers are still spending money they're still coming they're looking to promote we have a a lot of uh, online casinos and and poker rooms and and you know dating sites and and everybody knows that we're all at home right now so there's there's a big push to promote their products and and specials and stuff like that but uh, it's so far, we haven't seen too much of a downfall in the online media world, but um, I, I can relate with some of the people right now and, and what's going on. Well, uh, like you, uh, Jeff Davis, also involved in horse ownership and uh, south of the border based in Illinois, but you guys have teamed up uh, 
with some of your technology. We'll talk more about that later on in the show. But uh, Jeff, maybe just a bit about your your background and maybe uh, you know to start off, uh, you know what you do uh, primarily and uh, your involvement in horse racing. Right. Well, I I started first uh, going to Quad City Downs in East Moline, Illinois, back in the '70s, and uh, and now um, you know fast forward to now I. I have a couple of different ventures that I do and, and, uh, digital media is, is one of them and developing this app is another. And then of course we have, uh, some horses on different levels, some here in Illinois, some in different parts of the country. And, uh, we also stay in a couple stallions here in Illinois. So world of rock and roll in Stevensville. And what uh, what is the current uh, state of things in, in Illinois in terms of, uh, you know, both the state in general and uh, where racing you think fits in at this point? Well, I know uh, talking to everybody at Hawthorne, they're really um, hopeful that we can get back to racing soon. Um, we have Hawthorne and I believe the IHHA uh, leadership has gone to the governor's office and proposed kind of a, um, social distancing type of um, here's how we can race without fans, but this is what we'll do. The barns will, will how we'll handle who takes care of uh, each of the horses, no owners on the backstretch, just those people responsible for um, the horses in each race. And I believe they've got the sign off at public health. Uh, and now it's the plan is put before the governor here in Illinois and they're, you know, knock on wood that they're waiting for his approval to get back and racing. And I think as soon as they get the green light, I think they're probably up and going in about five days. So we're hopeful it's this month, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are getting disappointed, but we'd love to see a date sooner rather than later. Yeah. And it really is different from jurisdiction, jurisdiction to jurisdiction and, um, and hopeful is the right word uh, everywhere. And uh, certainly here in Ontario, uh, Rob Joyles, uh, welcome to the show. And, uh, Rob, if, uh, if you don't recognize that name right off the bat, uh, in the racing game, you certainly would, uh, recognize the stable name R A W equine, uh, Rob, uh, you know, you've been involved with many great horses over the years, but wanted to talk to you, first of all, though, about your primary business. Uh, you operate one of the largest fresh produce uh, sites in, in all of Canada. Maybe give us the background on, on that. Yeah, so I'm a partner in a company called Gambles, and we uh, uh, import uh, fresh produce from all over the world. And it's a wholesale distribution based in the Ontario Food Terminal. We also have a 70,000 square foot warehouse. It's just 10 minutes from the terminal that we, that we use to uh, receive most of our goods. It's uh, quite a dynamic business. You know, we're, we're still providing fresh fruits and vegetables to the people of Ontario right now. So it's an essential service. Yeah, and I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, you know, the relationship uh, with your father in the horse business. We'll get to that later, but uh, he was one of the early uh, principals in the company, right? Yes, he was. I started working on the food terminal in 1985 when I was I was too smart for school, so I went and got the <laughs> education at the University of the Ontario Food Terminal. And and you know there was a lot of concern. There has been a lot of concern about uh, the food supply chain uh, during the situation. So uh, yeah, I was going to ask you what impact, if if any, um, you know, the situation has had on your business. Uh, really, the only impact and things we've been worried about is getting migrant workers up here to work in greenhouses and, and for the summer crops, because when they closed the borders, the, the growers were concerned about getting enough help to get crops off, but they've, they've uh, looked after that issue. So things seem like they're on the up and up now. So we got a good supply of product all the time. I don't see any, any reason for people to panic when people are panic shopping. It was a little strange to me. Like there was sure. never any shortage of produce. Well, that's, uh, that's fantastic to hear. And uh, yeah, very uh, important uh, work that you're doing. There's no question about that. But let's talk, uh, let's talk the horse business and uh, maybe tell us about uh, your involvement. How far back does that go? Trotting club. So it goes back as long as I can remember as, as a kid. My grandfather was a, a horse trainer. He, he raced a small stable of horses in, in the London, Dresden, Woodstock area. 
race under the Beechwood name, and I carried that name onto my farm, the Beechwood Acres. And my dad, of course, followed um, him as well. And then I, I started getting into horses in 1989. I bought my first horse, a horse named Rocky Rum. And since then, we've uh, just kept buying horses every year. Um, <clears throat> we've had some nice ones. We've had some not so nice ones, of course, like everybody does. But it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, but, you know, my grandfather, and my dad, I really got me in the business. I can't I can't remember how old I was when I went to the track for the first time. Well, you talk about uh, getting your first horse in '89, and uh, it was only five years after that you uh, had a really good one named Rover Hanover, uh, who did win the Metro Pace. Uh, just talk a little bit about him. We're going to get a look back at uh, him now. And uh, at the time, you were teamed up with uh, recently transplanted BC trainer Joe Hudon. Uh, tell us about how that relationship came to be. Yeah, so I'm, I met Joe in the uh, Greenwood Grandstand. He's hang, hang around him quite a bit. We came, we became very friendly. And we went down to the Harrisburg sale and started buying some yearlings. Rover Hanover was, well, I think, the second horse that we, we bought together. Um, previous to that, we had a, a, a nice mare named Miss Log, but Rover was really the one that uh, stepped it up. And you know, Joe's a Joe's a hell of a horseman, a great friend, and um, I miss him in the business still. Yeah, I'd say uh, one of the really underrated horsemen. Uh, you mentioned it, uh, an all-round horseman sure. too, and uh, yeah, had a had a tremendous impact, especially uh, when he first. Uh, uh, relocated here from BC and uh, he's had a long wonderful career here in Ontario uh, the big moment though the Metro pace for Rover Hanover uh, we're gonna bring that uh, replay up and uh, have a look at it and this must bring back uh, wonderful memories for you yeah it gives me goosebumps I, I remember I mean as, as a gambler I mean the horse should not have been 50 to 1 based on you know his, his elimination he was only beaten maybe a length or a length and a half and he, he, he was really primed coming into a good race Joe gave him a great trip, and you know, just gives me goosebumps every time I see the see the race and hear, hear the hear the call. Yeah, Frank Saliva with the call. It was a slick steer from Joe Hudon, and uh, let's yeah. relive it with Frank Saliva. Off stride from seventh. The quarter was 26 and three. Big Albert isn't waiting. Ron Waples is sending him to the front, turning into the back stretch. Rover Hanover along the inside in second. Here comes Midnight Island stalking the pace third on the outside with JR Pro in fourth. Tattler's Torpedo is fifth on the outside. VP Finance has been out all the way. He's sixth on the outside. Then Gipperly from seventh. Highly visible is eighth further back to mentorius and the donald off a half in 56 and 3 30 seconds in the second quarter and there's midnight island for john campbell going calmly to the lead on the way to the last turn big albert is back in second tattler's torpedo is up on the outside third rover hanover from fourth vp finance is fifth and advancing on the outside gipperly in six jr pro has had a shuffle back to seventh then it's highly visible mentorius and the donald is out of it Midnight Island got three quarters in 125 and four. They turn into the stretch in the seventh Metro Stakes Championship, and that's Midnight Island and John Campbell on the lead at the eighth pole, and Tatler's Torpedo coming to him. Rover Hanover squeezing back to the outside, sensing an opportunity. Rover Hanover is getting up against Tatler's Torpedo and Midnight Island. Rover Hanover, Rover Hanover, the local horse gets it all for Joe. Yeah, one of the many great calls from Frank Salive. The local horse gets it all, and uh, yeah, great uh, look back there. Uh, quality of the video, not fantastic from 1994, but uh, hey, it's still very exciting uh, to watch. Um, uh, Jeff, uh, for a guy from Illinois, uh, I mean, uh, how, how uh, far back does your involvement go in racing, and uh, have you always kept an eye here north of the border? Quad City Downs, and um, I think I have a picture of me in the in the winter circle and holding the horse, and you know I'm trying to hold them up here. But there's a funny picture I have 1981 in the Quad City Downs when I was there. Ramblin' Willie came and raced there, and he got beat. And I knew the owner, or I had met the owner who won the horse or won the race. So we all ran in the winter circle and. I bought that picture just because 
Rambam Willie was in the race picture and, and was number, and he was second. Yeah, anytime uh, you got to watch Rambling Willie race, uh, that was certainly a, a career highlight. Uh, Adriano, a little different path for you, certainly to get into horse ownership, right? You uh, you were a graduate or you were a gentleman who attended one of the SBOA workshops. Is that correct? Right. So I, I was I, I had a couple of thoroughbreds back in the day, but I, I did want to get into standard breads. And I, and I, uh, I attended the SBOA mentor mentorship program and got involved uh Tammy McNiven got me involved with that and and uh, that's that's where it all started like I I laugh about it, it was a $4,500 investment at the time you own 10% of a horse and uh the SBOA put up the other um you know the other uh, 50 it was it was 10 people 4,500 uh for 45,000 and then I believe they put in the other 15,000 for a 60 total and you know they got a trainer who went out and got it got a, a yearling and and uh, and you know we got the yearly to the racetrack. It was to cover all the bills, and that's how I got involved, uh, you know, in harness racing. And then it just kind of escalated from there. And how did that first horse turn out? I probably or should, should I have ask? been part of the second group. <laughs> I, I think John Copus okay. had the second group, and uh, and uh, I, I I went into the first group because the, the trainer at the time was uh, was Casey Casey Coleman. And I, I heard a lot about Casey, and she's really good at picking horses. And you know that probably wasn't the, the best pick ever, but I, I, you know, it was all right. It was fun. It was a learning experience, and and you know, uh, it was a good way for the ten of us to to get involved in in harness racing. And I know of a few of those owners that still have gone on to uh, own uh, race horses. Some of them are actually involved with the stable uh, right now. Some have their own horses. So we kind of moved along from there and it's it's been a lot it's a long time that was a, that was it could be over 10 years ago yeah it's very interesting i think for casey uh, i believe uh, hopefully i'm getting the story correct but i think she was uh, at flamborough at the time and and got asked on a on a whim or had to replace somebody for a workshop <coughs> they were doing there and uh, i think picked up her first owner and and kind of went from there so uh, for you guys to cross paths at that point and uh, it wasn't long before you, you had a home run horse in Vegas vacation. Uh, we're going to get a look at, at him next. Um, just tell us how um, how that all unfolded early on. Yeah, that, um, you know, after the the mentorship program, uh, I asked Casey if she would, buy, if I can partner in on some babies at the time. And uh, she told me that her, her she had a bunch of owners already and, and it uh, I, I actually, she, she kind of uh, uh, pushed me towards uh, Blake McIntosh and I started, you know, uh, experimenting with the claiming game. And the following year, I went back to Casey and asked her if she wanted to uh, let me in on a part of a uh, couple horses. And we did buy a couple horses that year and I was done. I was only going to buy into two horses. And then along came the uh, Lexington sale and uh, I got a uh, message from her. She was at the Lexington sale and she said, you know, I bought this horse called Vegas Vacation. I know you love going to Las Vegas. You know, at the time I was doing a lot of trade shows in Las Vegas uh, for work. And uh, I didn't even ask her how much it was. I just said, yeah, count me in. I'll take I'll take half of him. And and sure enough, uh, I didn't even know how much he was. I, I wasn't even paying attention. And uh, he, he didn't sell for much. He sold for 32,000 and uh, I bought half of him. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a storyline behind that um, f- from you know what I understand from what happened back then is she she would, went to the sale to look at this horse. He was hip number five, and her and uh, and her partner in her stable and also uh, Steve Calhoun went to go look at this horse, and they thought that he'd probably sell for I, I I'm, I'm trying to get this right maybe uh, eighty thousand. They thought he was a gorgeous looking horse, and he would sell for about eighty. And then just before the sale started, I think Steve backed out. He said he. He didn't want to go in on part of the horse, and she said that she was still going to buy him. And then he sold for thirty-two thousand, and she turned around and asked him, and he said, "We must have missed something on him because there's no way he would have sold for thirty-two thousand. So he stayed out. I got in. Lucky enough for me, I, I was able to to uh, benefit from that. And um, and you know, there we are. He turned out. He was a he was a good two-year-old. Um, it was, you know, he didn't have his mind on the game at all. That's why you see him wearing this, you know, the shady daisy uh, over his, his, you know, his, his face. And uh, at three, he was really good. And we were in a tough, tough year. I mean, we chased Captain Treacherous around the racetrack the entire time. So 
for him to make a million, you know, uh, almost a million dollars that year and be able to win the jug and a lot of uh, nice races, uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting, that's for sure. Yeah, it had to be a wild ride and uh, pretty heady for uh, for a guy that's uh, relatively new into the ownership game. Uh, we are going to show the Little Brown Jug now. And, uh, you know, we've been looking uh, back at some Jug classics in recent weeks and some of those epic battles. But on this day, it really wasn't much of a battle. Uh, he, he was superior and, uh, you know, the end result was never really in doubt. So let's have a look at it with Roger Houston and the call and we'll talk more about it after uh, we watch. Absolute authority on the day, Adriano, and uh, still fun to watch, I'm sure, for you. And uh, must have been some epic celebrations following that day. Um, I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because right at the end there, you see Brian give the thumbs up. I had jumped right in the middle of the racetrack. I didn't care who was coming at me. I was pretty excited. And, and just before that, I, I'm pretty sure I crushed the uh, Casey as a, a assistant trainer at the time was Anthony Beaton. And I'm pretty, he was standing a little bit too close to me. So I'm pretty sure I might have broke a couple of his ribs the way I, I was picking him up and going up and down. It was pretty exciting. You know, he owned a piece of that horse as well. So it was uh, it was exciting for all of us, especially coming back off of uh, she had won the previous year with Michael's power. And that was that was the first year that I, I went to the Little Brown Jug was the Michael Power year. So uh, to go back the next year and, and then win the Little Brown Jug with Vegas Vacation was pretty uh, it, it's uh you know, it's one of those moments that, that uh, when you win it, you, you think it, it's going to happen again. But I, I've been trying ever since, and it's, uh, it's a tough race to be in and, and let alone win it. So it, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. And Rob, uh, for all the good horses you've had, uh, I, I, I'm not sure about this. Have you ever had one in the jug or at least in the eliminations? Yeah, yeah. When, when Adriana was celebrating, I was at the buffet licking my wounds. Sunfire okay. was in that race. Okay. He's in the elimination. He didn't race well. Sure about that. Yeah. yeah. He didn't make the final. But uh, he definitely went on to have a, a great uh, career, no question about that. And uh, yeah. we're going to pull up that trivia question. And uh, Curtis, our producer, uh, if you can flip flop our trivia question, so actually, question two, can you bring that one up instead? Uh, since we're talking about Sunfire Blue Chip, let's bring up that trivia question first of the night. And uh, if you think you know the answer, leave it in the comment section. And uh, from all the winning answers tonight, we will draw one name at random for a $25 COSA gift card. And uh, on the topic of Sunfire Blue Chip, he posted his first major stakes victory in what race? 
and we'll give you some time to uh, think about that. And uh, when you have the answer, leave it in our comment section. Sunfire Blue Chip. So, yeah, the Little Brown Jug, maybe not his day, but uh, he had plenty of big wins over the course of his career. Uh, I think we've got a photo of him now to have a look at. Um, and uh, interesting, uh, you had this guy with Jimmy Tactor, um, Rob, and, and just one of many uh, different conditioners that you guys have had horses with uh, over the years. And is that by design? Well, it's actually just about, about years in the business and becoming friendly with people and, you know, relationships that we've, we've, uh, we've made. And, you know, I, I always like to have my trainers have a piece of the horse. So most of the trainers we have, uh, all take shares in the horses we have. Well, this guy was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, a real uh, slick gated horse. I thought he was especially deadly on half mile tracks. Um, I remember him here in London a couple of times and, Speaking of close calls, Rob, uh, you know, you were very close to winning in track record time here in what was then the Molson Pace. Um, but uh, in Montreal at the Prix de uh, he, he really uh, showed his stuff. Uh, what do you recall about uh, that particular day in Three Rivers? I remember contemplating whether we should go down. My dad and I liked doing road trips. And then, he, then he drew the eight hole and we said, you know what? It's a long way to go for an eight hole. <laughs> and then he went out there and raced like a bearcat. He was he was awesome that day. Yeah, and you did end up going. We did not end up going. Oh no, that's yeah. too bad. Disappointing. But... I was, I was, yeah, I was going to ask you about the atmosphere. Uh, I'm sure it was fantastic there. Uh, they love their yeah, racing it looked, it looked in the province of Quebec, and uh, we're going to take a look back at that one now. And uh, yeah, one of uh, the most impressive efforts from uh, the great career of Sunfire Blue Chip. And here is the call from back in 2014. Here they come, ready for action from downtown Trois-Rivières. Hip pity, hip pity, hip pity, how? Boom! Is so party, they're off and pacing. Numéro 2, Cissé Maru, at attention, Sunshine Beach. Outside, Mackey, so give it challenge. Apprentice, and over. Entre deux adversaires, plutôt Sunfire, Blue Chip, Duke d'Orléans, mais ton cinquième. Sixième, six, looking and over. Outside, Apprentice, and over. Et derrière le piton, Captain of the Ends. Outside, Mackey, so Scott Zero, now takes over. Right here. Right now, Yannick Gingra moving up into the lead. And Sunfire Blue Chip, he may not take 50 seconds to get the opening quarter. 26 seconds even. Very fast, very okay for the new track record. Sunfire Blue Chip, Yannick Gingra, he is assis dans la chaise de Barbier. Mack is still deuxième second. Troisième third, C.C. Maru. Quatrième fourth outside, first over Sunshine Beach with Doug Metner. It's getting ground. Cinquième fifth, too wide. David Miller with looking at over. Sixième sixth. Duc d'Orléans, two wide apprentices and over in outside in closing the path keep captive audience. Thank on Chapter and Enemy, the first half and fifty four and one. Second split twenty eight and one. Yannick Jenga still there with Sunfire Blue Chip. Outside is challenging Sunshine Beach. Twice and third on the side of town. Mac it's so it's got zero. Catherine and Ford looking out over the swing three wide for Davin Miller. Thank him fifth apprentice and over. CM six a captive audience. On to the adversary Duc d'Orléans, ici c'est Maru, une vingt deux et un trois quarts, trois quarts, one twenty two and one, et Yannick Gingra à ton peloton, avec son fire blue chip still there, Mac it still, Scott Zero, now has started challenging, troisième tour, Duc d'Orléans, dans un manc, looking on over, and coming down to the wire, Yannick Gingra is well on top, son fire blue chip, watch your step, check the telly timer, and son fire blue chip, son fire blue chip, one fifty and three, in Saint new track record. Duc d'Orléans et deuxième. Sunfire Blue Chip with Yannick Gingras. Gagne le prix d'été 2014 à l'Ibodon Trois Rivières. Un enjeu de 200 000 dollars. Un nouveau record de piste. Une big, big effort, 150 and 3. And uh, we saw all the umbrellas there that day. It was uh, an off track and, uh, and post eight and uh, no obstacle. Sunfire Blue Chip, uh, again, very lethal on a half mile track in particular. And uh, what, what's the status on him, Rob? He's, he's still racing, is he not? He is still racing, still... yeah. Actually, he, he, was, he was the three to two morning line favorite the last time at Yonkers, and they canceled the races. So he, he, and he'd won the start before that, Ouch. I believe. So, he, he, yeah, he's still, he's still racing. He's such a nice old horse. He's a, he's a tough old horse. J Jimmy just loves him. It's one of his pets. Yeah. In terms of horses Gary you're Kendall, involved Kendall, with, uh, 
Yeah, what's what's your approach? Uh, you know, you've got a mix. You've got older, you know, pacing horses like him. You've got young trotters and kind of everything in between. Yeah, we really only have uh, anything uh, old. Sorry, anything old, older than three. Anything older than three, we only have uh, five horses. We got um, fifteen uh, three-year-olds and and thirteen two-year-olds. So generally, once they're past their three-year-old year, we, we we tend to sell them. But Sunfire has got, always have a special place in our heart. We we bred him for a few years. One of his, one of his babies won the uh, OSS Gold Superfinal last year. B Stoney, that's one of his boys. So yeah. he just didn't get supported as a sign. So we put him back on the racetrack. Right. And now your father Wayne is retired from uh, from the family business, but uh, we understand he's at uh, your farm where you've got uh, the breeding stock. Uh, where's that located, and uh, and how many horses do you have there? So, so the, the, the farm is uh, located in Burlington, Ontario. It's just 10 minutes south of Mohawk. We have, uh, we, we have about uh, 10 brood mares there. We got, we got a couple of mares down in the States as well. And then we, got, we have six um, yearlings now that will go into the Harrisburg sale this year. Um, <clears throat> we have a few, like I said, we have a few down in the States at Concord Stud Farm and, and, and some with Hundred Farm as well. So they're kind of spread out, but... The, the farm is mainly for the for the brood mares and the, and the babies, and then we have a, a we have a half mile track there as well that we have four different trainers there that to rent rent stalls from us. We have one a couple of horses of our own in training there with different trainers, but mostly uh, mostly for the brood mares. Okay, and Jeff, in terms of uh, the horses you have, uh, you, you've got a mix as well. You've had horses with the likes of Ron Burke, uh, but I understand you also stand. Uh, two or three stallions. Yeah, we have uh, Stevensville, which is uh, a full brother to Huntsville um, this year, standing in Illinois. Um, he was with Ray Snicker and as a, primarily as a racehorse. Uh, very good horse, nice, big, great confirmation. Uh, we think he'll do well in Illinois. Uh, we also have World of Rock and Roll, and of course it comes from the Captain Treacherous family. And, very bred very well um he was in ohio for some some years and really didn't get supported there and kind of got into the mix of uh ohio getting slots and then, then every it seems like even today there's always a stallion at the end of the year going to ohio and so he got overwhelmed so we we picked him up a couple of years ago and for illinois you know in transition uh who i mean we passed the slots last year uh he's been a he's been a real good he throws some nice babies i really like him good stuff uh, we've got our second trivia question of the night to go to next and uh we're going to talk jimmy freight this time jimmy freight is sports writers highest money winning offspring we want to know who's the second richest performer of the stallion sports writer and again if you think you know the answer uh, just leave it for us in the comments section and speaking of uh, Jimmy Freight, uh, Adriano, uh, a home run here and, and a real interesting story. Take us back to, to how you, you came to purchase this guy. He'd been racing uh, on the Iowa fairs. I mean, how does a horse like that end up coming to Ontario and doing what he did? Right. So uh, I actually, uh, I got a call from, uh, from an agent that I use, Mark Reynolds, and we had a deal set up for another horse. Uh, the horse is, uh, I can't remember his name. I, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, is another horse. And we had a deal for that and it kind of fell through in the last minute. And, uh, and Mark knew it was a little bit upset because we've been trying to get this deal put together for, for, you know, to buy this horse. And, uh, he called me back a couple of days later and he told me, I got another horse for you. And I said, all right, are they, are they willing to sell was the first question that I asked because, you know, sometimes you put a lot of work into this and you, you just can't buy them, you know, especially when you know, you know, who's buying them, you know, it, it, everything tends to change a little bit. And he said, no, I think we can, I think we can get this horse. And I was asking him for, for the name, but he wouldn't tell me. And, uh, and I said, what's the name of the horse? He says, well, let me, let me explain to you a little bit about the horse first. He's racing in the, in the Iowa circuit. And I'm like, Mark, 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 just give me his name. He's like, no, because you're going to look him up and you probably won't like what you see. But uh, sure enough, he, he gave me the name. He told me it was Jimmy Freight. And I, I was on track it. And uh, I pulled up his lines. 
and I just I I actually started just laughing at him on the phone because I I couldn't believe I was two 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 oh eight two sixteen, you know. So he convinced me that it, that that the track is you know it's some of those times two oh eight, and you know that these are these are times down there. So at the time I had a horse called Ballarat Boomerang that came out of uh, Iowa. So I went to go look at his lines and I kind of compared the two of them together. And there's no video or anything about Jimmy Freight anywhere. So I started doing a little bit of research. Um, I found a Facebook video on this Iowa page. Uh, somebody shot it from up in the stands, and, and I and I watched his race, a lot, very blurry, far away. And and I was just, you know, something caught my eye. It just looked like they were racing in a in a sand pit, and I, the tires were like four inches in into this, you know, in the, into the dirt. And I was thinking to myself, man, this horse. He just went 158 in this track. And I'm like, if we can get him to come up here and, you know, take six seconds off, this could be a good OSS horse. So sure enough, I said to Mark, let's try to get this deal done. And it couldn't, we couldn't even get a hold of anyone. Uh, at the time, I had horses with Tony Alanya. And Tony, uh, I told him about the horse. And then a couple of days later, he called me back and he said uh, he knew uh, uh, Larry Mather, which was one of the owners on the horse. And he said he talked to Larry and um, – and uh, we could probably get a deal done, and we did. We ended up getting a deal done. I bought him for 115000 U.S., and he was on a trailer and on his way from Iowa all the way up to, uh, I believe it was PA, and then over to New Jersey. Uh, we had already missed the first OSS gold for the year, uh, and so we managed to get him up here before the second. The second OSS gold was three days, three days after he shipped up and uh I, I remember he ended up getting the seven hole he was 10 to one jonathan drury was driving him for tony alanya and uh and he ended up winning out of the out of the seven hole he ended up winning his first race here uh in i want to say it was 52 and 52 and a piece and uh, at the time i was like wow you know we might have we might have got something here you know and and that's that's how all that came you know uh came about yeah, that, that's a gamble. 115 U.S. Uh, for a horse racing uh, in Iowa at the time and, uh, you know, to come to Ontario. But as we know, uh, looking back now, that gamble paid off uh, handsomely. Uh, let's take a look at one of his most impressive wins uh, here in the province of Ontario. It came uh, as a three-year-old uh, toward the end of the campaign and the OSS Super Final. And uh, at this point in the year, uh, just within the provincial program, uh, it, it had turned into a very deep group. There were three or four that uh, were all capable of pacing under 150 at the time. So uh, it wasn't a gimme for Jimmy Freight. He had to work very hard uh, for the win. And we'll take a look back and uh, have the race call with Ken from 2018. Here they come. They're off and pacing it. Good beginning at the inside, the downtown bus in Levi's Day left out hard. Burning Midnight is up close there from in third. Backstreet Shadows slides up in between horses to fourth now. Jimmy Freight caught wide fifth, sixth inside Sports Legend. Then a gap of two to Sharp Action Money and St. Lad's Neptune. Final two as they go to the quarter Taste of History and Western Passage. To the front went McNair with the downtown bus. They lead through the opening quarter in 27 flat, but pressing on comes the parked out Backstreet Shadow. Back into third is Levi Stay. It's burning midnight. Fourth now. Fifth inside to Sports Legend. Gap of two to Jimmy Freight from sixth. Seventh now. Sharp action money. He'll tip to the outside. He'll force the hand of Wah. Jimmy Freight's got to come. And Jimmy Freight is first over as sharp action money got underway from the backfield. Scooting through up the inside. Taste of history. Then St. Lad's Neptune and Western Passage Trails coming up to the midway point. They're there in 55-4. and four. A 28-4 second quarter. Tactical advantage for Backstreet Shadow. Though here outside comes Jimmy Freight to test his stablemate now. Back in that pocket spot from third, the downtown bus. Overland fourth is Sharp Action Money on a sweet-looking trip. St. Lad's Neptune, he's a towed-up fifth now. Then sixth inside to Levi's Day. Burning Midnight swings out. Then it's Western Passage, followed by Sports Legend and Taste of History. Three-quarters of a mile. They're over there in 123-3. and three. That was a 27-4. and four. Buzz saw the third quarter. And it's Backstreet Shadow and Jimmy Freight going at it now. They exchange glances. 
passes, and they've hooked wheels into deep stretch. Still there at the inside. That was Backstreet Shadow. Jimmy Freight is sweeping up on the outside to take him on here with a final 16th. Now escaping, trying to find some late racetrack in tight quarters, trying to come on through there. As the downtown bus, he really got tight. This one goes to Jimmy Freight. It was Jimmy Freight to survive the tough trip to win the Super Final in 150 and 2. So that was uh, him capping off the, the three-year-old campaign. Uh, I believe earlier in the year he uh, he took on older rivals in the in the Gold Cup, did he not, Adriano? Uh, you know, in a rarity, three-year-olds taking on the the older free-for-allers. Right. He he was in the, the Gold Cup, uh, and uh, you know, Richard uh, Richard, I, I had no idea we were gonna we were gonna enter there, but uh, Richard put him in. He thought he would you know he'd be all right. We wanted to get a race into him as well and he was uh he was he was racing real good at the time and and uh and uh, i believe Cintra won the, the gold cup that year and uh mcwicked was second and jimmy was uh he had a little bit of traffic problems there on the rail and in, in that in that race but he was coming pretty good up the rail and uh, and he finished third there and uh, it's tough it's really early it's kind of still early in, into their three-year-old year if you really think about it and uh and to race in the in the gold cup it's not many three-year-olds you know will race against the older horses there especially going against the likes of uh you know Sintra and mcwicket and there was there was a ron burke had a few horses in that in that race too with uh with i'm not sure which ones they were i'm pretty sure check six or something was in there but um yeah it was a it was a tough field so that was a uh, you know finishing thing you never get excited about a third like you but I was pretty excited about that. It showed. I was. I was like, all right, you know, maybe we'll get him next year, and and, and we did. Yeah. So, yeah, and not a real big horse, but his durability uh, really impressed me uh, as a three-year-old. Now we saw it again at age four. He had, uh, he had some of the toughest trips I have uh, seen seen a horse uh, get uh, during the season. It didn't always work out for him, but uh, he did have his moments where uh, when a trip did work out. He knew exactly what to do with it. And uh, one of the races we're going to look at is the Dayton Derby. Uh, perhaps never better than on this night. And uh, uh, let's uh, first throw to the replay, have a look at it, and then uh, we'll just get your reaction afterwards. They're off and pacing. This is the plan. Going out for the lead. Western fame to his inside. They will duel into the first turn. McWicket is their third. Taken back fourth. Filibuster Hanover. Then it is Jimmy Freight Endeavor, and don't tell me again, the early trailer. Western Fame on the inside, outside, this is the plan. Battling for the early lead into clear of Mick Wicked. Racing fourth is Filibuster Hanover, the quarter, 26 and 1. This is the plan, makes his way to the top on the give and go. Right back out, Western Fame marches to the top. Mick Wicked is next, then it is Filibuster Hanover. Jimmy Freight peeking to the outside for Scotty Z, followed by Endeavor, and don't tell me again, is the trailer. Field of seven around the panic turn, on over to the half. It's Western Fame up top showing the way. All over Noble's helmet from the pocket. This is the plan, the half, 53 and three, 27 and two, second panel, and here comes Mick Wicked. With his cover is Jimmy Freight on the outside, racing fourth. Pinned in fifth, filibuster Hanover. Endeavor on the outside, and don't tell me again is the trailer. They drive for three quarters. It's Western Fame by a length. McWicket is at his wheel. This is the plan. Pocket sitter and begging for room. Outside, Jimmy Freight. He's ready to go three wide. Nowhere to go for filibuster Hanover. Endeavor is next. Don't tell me again. Six to make up. One, 20, and four. 27 and one. Backside, and McWicket is put ahead in front of Western Fame. Three wide. Here comes Jimmy Freight. This is the plan. Looking for room anywhere. It's McWicket a short lead on the outside. Comes Jimmy Freight at ten to one to win the Dayton Pacing Derby in one forty-eight and three. So yeah, Jimmy Freight, uh, really a much deserved win and in, in a tough, tough four-year-old campaign for him. Uh, now standing stallion at uh, Winback Farm and. Uh, Adriano, you got a lot of, uh, I think, positive attention for uh, some of the outside the box uh, advertising and promotion you did with him, uh, which is a little bit different than we've seen, including the Jimmy Freight Stakes uh, that uh, is set to go. And uh, it seems like that paid off. Uh, his book is full and closed, correct? 
Right. His book is uh, is full and closed. And, you know, I, I thank the breeders. There's a lot of people that came to the plate and bred from all over the place. We had a lot of people out in the U.S. and and a lot of our Ontario breeders, which was nice to see. And, you know, I, I, I put a lot of work behind it. I, I always said if this day ever came and I had a stallion that I was going to use whatever knowledge I have in advertising and marketing to be able to promote them. I just feel like there's a lot we can do when it comes to, you know, our stallions and, and promoting our racing. And this is what I wanted to do. Well, we certainly hope uh, he can pass on his talent to his offspring. And we really look forward to seeing them uh, on the racetrack uh, sometime soon. So uh, Jimmy Freight, fun to look back at, uh, at his racing career as well. Uh, just before we go to a commercial break, guys, I'm going to ask each of you this question. Uh, it was from uh, one of our viewers, and I think it's a good one. Um, talking about uh, yearling sales or young horses and uh, your process there, Rob, uh, the question is, do you pick out yearlings yourself do you have someone else kind of guide you in the, in that process how does that work uh, you know there's certain breeds i like certain maternal families that i like but as far as confirmation i leave that to the experts we go and look at them and and you know the trainer's got to pass them but uh i, I got a, a decent eye for a horse but i'm not i'm not going to call myself an expert by any means i mean <laughs> guys like barry soderberg is looking at horses for you know, months and months and months. And right when they come out of the womb, I think he's here looking at them. So it's hard, it's hard to beat yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, what about yourself? Same. I love to look at a catalog and, you know, make my list. But um, I'm certainly not going to be uh, picking the ones out of confirmation and uh, so forth and so on. So I leave that to the experts. And Adriano, you're, uh, you're in the advertising business, but... Uh, What's your expertise like in terms of picking out yearlings? Yeah, there's there's certain families that I do like and with the yearlings. Again, I, I do a lot of uh, page folding and, and stuff like that. And then uh, usually the trainers that, uh, that, that are going to sale that I'm looking to buy horses with, they'll send me lists and I'll take a look at the list. But again, I'm, I'm the same page like everyone else. Uh, you know, that that's their business. They're the, the professionals that are going out there and they're looking at these babies at farms you know they're flying in and out looking at their horses at farms and a lot of videos and pedigrees and most of them have trained horses from horses of you know families and and they understand it a lot better so um you know i like to, to see those lists and and pick a few and then go out and see those horses as well if i can get to the farms uh definitely when we're at the sales i like to look at them but at the end of the day you know, you have to put your trust in the hands of where the horses are going to be, you know, th throughout their progress. And that's and that's where, uh, uh, you know, I leave it. I, I always say we just sign the checks. We let them do all the work. And, and, you know, at that point, hopefully it works out for everyone. Again, our special guest tonight, Adriano Sorella, Jeff Davis and Rob Giles, uh, thanking them for uh, taking the time to be with us uh, tonight and thanking you for your questions. Uh, we'll try and get to a few more before the end of the show, so uh, leave those for us in the comments section. Right now, we will take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with more in just a moment. A look at the new scratch and win promotion uh partnering there cosa and ontario racing and adriano i know you're helping them out a little bit uh, with the advertising on that as well and uh, we're seeing that uh as well on all these new trailer wraps around the province right that's correct and uh you know cosa has been doing a, a real good job with their with their marketing uh with the trailer wraps i absolutely love the idea um uh, I think it's fantastic to, to have that form of advertising, mobile billboards all over the place. Sure, we're not seeing them right now because of racing, but these things are going to be on the road and they're, they're headed all over the place. And it's great promotion for the trainers. The trailers look fantastic. The designs are incredible. And uh, the free scratch app is on every single trailer and, and it's exciting stuff. I, uh, uh, 
really excited for what what the marketing uh, strategies that Post has been taken with uh, with uh, a bunch of these different things that they're doing, like the show, and and it's it's exciting. Yeah, I would agree, and I think it's going to be really exciting when those trailers are are in motion and uh, visible, and the general public uh, starts to to get engaged. Uh, hopefully, with that, uh, Jeff Davis, uh, we want to talk to you about a new product. Uh, we just read about it in the last few days. Uh, it sounds very exciting. It's called Hoofbid. It's a new app uh, that uh, deals with the uh, online auction for horses and, and horse sales. Uh, tell us what Hoofbid is and how it came to be. Well, um, my co-founder and myself, uh, Frank Tatuli, um, we actually met at the U.S. Uh, TA's driving school back in uh, 2012 when it was held at Goshen. Uh, became instant friends and we've owned some horses together and gone through some different uh, uh, different good times and bad times on horses and then we were talking about trying to create something that was easy to use for for people that would have the new technology that uh, these phones and that everybody's walking around with I mean just think about it when we were when we were kids I remember my uh, math teacher always saying you know you got to learn how to do this. I mean, you're not going to walk around with the calculator your whole life, are you? Well, we really are now. We've got <laughs> a camera, we've got a phone, we have, you know, a calculator. So, you know, most people these days have the phone within, you know, five feet from them at any given moment uh, of the day. So we we thought it was a, a important step forward for the business, uh, for the whole industry that we bring it, you know, to the new kind of technology. So we started about a year ago uh, with our development team and uh, really built it from the ground up, trying to, to walk through. We, we do regular listings, we do auction listings. So you can see the, you know, vividness of the photos, which is because it's built for the, uh, the actual phone. It's not built for anything. Um, so, you know, listings are, you know, really, uh, look nice and, uh, the technology behind it, you know, it's built on a powerful scalable system, you know, architect, you know, built by, you know, our, our team. Um, so it should hand, you know, can handle, um, lots of different situations. And oh, you have you your do this. first. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's walk through this first. Uh, maybe kind of walk us through some of the functions of the. Uh, yeah. So we're going. So this is how you begin to list a horse. You you type in your horse name. You search. We're integrated with uh, uh, Standard Bread Canada and their track it system. So you type in your horse name. You do a search. You'll find a list of horses. And uh, if you don't fill out the whole name, I think you can search after five letters. Then once you, uh, you want to do it again, yeah, just do Winsung and then do B, right. And then you should find a whole list. And I think she might be at the bottom there. Yep. So you select her there. Come in and uh, because of our uh, integration, it fills in Sire, the dam, what the gate is. The type is the type of listing that you're creating. So if the if she's still a racehorse you do a racehorse you can pick broodmare um either one in this case she's a racehorse yep. then you come back to no you don't do you just do a racehorse there but you can pick yeah so then it has the year born you can you can tap on there and select uh, a photo right on your phone um, which allows you to upload it nearly instantly. Select it, boom, it's there. So then you can have the owner, you can have the, you can put in your trainer. Then you select the kind of sell options. We have a regular sale, which is uh, basically a 30 day listing. So you can have select owner, you contact owner, firm price, negotiable, or best offer whichever is appropriate or like you said like there's see it there you can you can choose an auction setting 
what we've planned on doing now is doing Sunday night auctions. Part of uh, some of the struggles I think people have had is when do auctions start? When do they end? And so we're going to do the Sunday night auctions and drive people uh, so that they know Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern or 6 p.m. Central, you know, the horses are going to go into the ring. So if you go up, you can also set, uh, yeah, there. So you can set your, your options, right? So your starting price, you can say, okay, I want to start this horse at $1,000. And then I want to reserve maybe at $10,000. And then I can go and do bid increments. Right now, the default's 100, 500, or 1,000. You can select whichever one you want, come back. Then you pick the service plan, which is done. Then you can do featured advertising, which would put you in another part of the app. But the real neat feature here, too, is race video. So select the race video. And in this case, I know Winsung Brooklyn raced at Hawthorne. So we select Hawthorne race course, and we put in Saturday, I believe, March 14th. And hit select. Next, in our integration, what it does is, so this uh, shows you every race that was at Hawthorne that day. So if you know the exact race, you can go right to it and add it to your, your cart. If you can't remember exactly, you can click one and you have a 35 second preview of that race. So you can go in, um, listen to it, usually, 35 seconds, you can get the, you know, first quarter and say, oh, yeah, you know, that's the race. Uh, nope, six race, that's not it. Scroll down, let's see, uh, let's try the ninth race. And you start seeing the limited preview here. And then, oh, yeah, that's her. She's going to go right to the front. So you can X out of it. You can watch all 35 seconds. You can do whatever you want. You hit add to the cart underneath the race nine. It brings you back. And now you are uh, ready to pay for your selection. You can go. If you've already loaded uh, your credit card, you can do that. You can just hit check out. And it says uh, pay. You check out. And then what happens on the back end is important. So your, your listing doesn't go immediately into the app. It goes into a back office for us so that we can make sure one, you should be able to, um, you should be able to list that horse. We double check, we make sure that um, the information's correct, gives us a little bit uh, of a review time. So as you can see, uh, it says submitted for review. When that goes into review from our back end, the owner gets a notification saying your horse is being reviewed. And then usually it takes a minute or two um, if everything is correct. Uh, we hit approve. You get another, uh, you get another notification saying uh, your horse is ready to be listed. And depending if you're a if you're a regular sale, your 30-day sale, you will be on that. If you are in an auction, it will go live the moment the auction is released. And currently, right now, auctions for Sunday nights, which are at seven, will be released Friday afternoons. So you have uh, we'll have them released. At of what's going to be offered Sunday night. Yeah, very, very slick uh, technology. It, it seems very user-friendly. And uh, this Sunday, your first auction, and you've got something unique planned, right? Yeah, we, you know, we have uh, uh, one, one trainer and, and owner. They're going to do a take-your-pick auction. That's what we're calling it. So you're going to have horse A and horse B. And you're going to have one auction listing for horse A and B. And people can come in and they can bid on 
uh, if they like A or they like B, it doesn't matter. They can do. There's one bid for both of those horses, and if you are the winning bidder of that uh, auction, you get to select. I want A or I want B, and the trainer has uh, committed to take whichever horse that you do not choose will go back into their barn for at least 30 days. So it is a situation where where people always wonder, are trainers trying to dump a horse? They don't want to get rid of a horse. This gives a buyer confidence that the trainer and the owners are like, no, we like these horses, but maybe we have to move some here and there. Maybe we need to make room for, we have some horses coming in or yearlings coming in. Um, it allows them to kind of give confidence to the buyer. So I think it's the first time that it has done, been done online. I am did some reading about this type of, of horse auction. Um, I know it was done at Delaware sale in February by the Burt Brigade. And then I also know that I think it was a concept by uh, Murray Brown originally. Uh, I think I saw an article uh, that was maybe from last year that he talked about doing that with some broodmares, I believe. All right. Well, to find out more, uh, visit hoofbid.com, available on Google Play and uh, the App Store. And if you sign up for an account or create an account during May, you're automatically entered for a chance to win $1,000. And uh, again, just to, to verify, uh, for those you're, uh, who sign up now, your first listing will be free. Is that, uh, is that right? That is correct. We're doing a, a, for a regular listing, it's normally $99, just a flat fee, $99. Depend, doesn't uh, matter what price your horse is. Uh, that will be refunded to you. And if you are uh, doing an auction, uh, we will refund that 99 after, uh, after the sale. All right. Well, well thanks for, uh, for that and, uh, and best of luck with, uh, with that product. It, it looks very exciting. And uh, let us know what you think in the comments section mm -hmm. and uh, see if you uh, feel that uh, this is going to be something that's going to be a kind of a regular part of your tool kit uh, when uh, looking at purchasing horses throughout North America. Uh, we want to continue on and uh, get back uh, to the horses here for the last part of the show. And, uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of... Uh, uh, great mares that uh, we've seen a lot of here in Ontario and, and one that really became a fan favorite. Uh, she was a daughter of uh, the late Cam Luck and her name was the Joy Luck Club. Uh, Rob, uh, where where does she rate for you? I mean, you've had horses that have made more money, etc. cetera, but uh, I think she's one of your favorites, is she not? Oh, she certainly is. She was, she was a homebred, so she was definitely has a special place in our heart. And, uh, you know, she, she just, we, we bought her mother in Lexington. She wasn't real a success story. So we, we, we bred her. She's got good maternal lines. That's why they talk about liking certain maternal families. We bred her to Camluck and, uh, and that, that was a, we lost the first two foals actually. So third time was a charm. So she was a, she was a real special mare to have. Mark and Mike Horner and, and their family did a great job on ra raising her and getting her to the racetrack and, and it was a lot of ex exciting to watch a race every week. Yeah, I remember her as a young filly. Uh, she's the type that caught your eye uh, the first time you saw her race. She had a real presence on the racetrack, uh, a big, strong filly, beautiful gait. Uh, was she a natural from day one? Uh, I know Mark liked her for a long time. He was always talked about her, how, how good she was. So I, I'm always, I, I got to see it to believe it. So because you hear from the trainers all the time how great Right on her for sure. He like he liked her early. Absolutely, and uh, for such a like big filly, good, good on good on all size tracks. I think that was uh, really what was uh, very impressive about her. And a uh, good illustration of that is the race we're going to look at next. Uh, back in 2017 at Clinton Racetrack, a small half mile track here in southwestern Ontario, where she captures uh, the kin pace on that day with Doug McNair in the driver's seat. And here's a look back at that one. 
uh, from 2017. And we'll get a look at it there. And she's, uh, she's toward the outside of the gate. Going to take her a little while to make the lead. And, um, Rob, you said earlier you didn't make it to the Prix de Tay. Were you here in person this day to watch this one? Oh, we were there for that, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. I love going. I love going to those small tracks. Yeah, I was going to say Clinton. Uh, Clinton Raceway. Adriano would probably concur with this. Uh, one of those tracks where uh, it's just a wonderful experience, and uh, and the crowd gets into it. Unfortunately, likely not going to see that uh, the live attendance this year. But uh, you know, very few that can replicate that atmosphere, right, Adriano? It's uh, getting to those little small tracks, especially a track like Clinton. That's a, it's a lot of fun just to be up and close there and, and the people. It's just exciting. Like you can see them back there too. It's just, it's exciting to be in those type of races and, and those type of racetracks. Yeah, the distinctive red barn on the uh, the final turn and people uh, sitting up and picnic tables up on the bank and, and watching the horses. So uh, here it is uh, again from 2017, the Kin Pace final and uh, the long striding, the Joy Luck Club in total command with a half mile to go. Second, second quarter and the Joy Luck Club. She looks strong up front here as they go to three quarters and she kicks away by two in the blink of an eye. Stonebridge Sunday on to take over second. Love's Angel backpedaling on the inside. There's Rose Lilly coming on from far back. Stellenbosch trying to get up into it late. The Joy Luck Club accelerating on the front end and she's opened up four. Stonebridge Sunday second. Rose Lilly third. Three quarters and one twenty-seven. Eight left to go and they're going to have to do some pacing if they're going to catch the Joy Luck Club. She's clear by four and she's got it on cruise control late. It's all the Joy Luck Club dominant winner in the Kin Pace final. Stonebridge Sunday. Big trip to hold second. Finishing third. Rose Lilly and fourth went to Stellenbosch. Yeah, a lot of fun uh, on that day, uh, Rob, and uh, she's given you a lot of great memories. Um, what is the Joy Luck Club up to now? So she's now, she's been retired down to uh, New Jersey. She's at Concord Stud Farm, and she's in full to Captain Crunch. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to uh, to wait uh, for that arrival. Uh, another great mare that uh, made her way north of the border a couple of years back. Um, she electrified the racing world uh, when she paced uh, sub-148 at Lexington's Red Mile, and her name is Double A Mint. And Jeff and Adriano both with a tie uh, to this mare. Uh, Jeff, uh, talk about her early days when, when you were involved. Yeah, uh, Double A Mint was uh, purchased by uh, Ron Burke and his team, and I was lucky enough to be part of it. Um, she actually is a half sister to, a another horse that I owned. Okay. Heavenly who happens to be, I always, uh, tease, uh, Adriano. Uh, she happens to be, uh, sports writers fastest daughter. So he's got the fastest uh, son, which I think is a little bit more profitable by the way. Um, but <laughs> I have the fastest daughter of sports writer still do. I, uh, still own the mayor. Um, with Steve Dye in uh, New Jersey, and she had a Sweet Lou baby this early this spring, and um, I think she's being bred back to betting line this year. Um, but it's Double Mint's half sister, and so luckily we uh, she did well at two, uh, showed some uh, some good miles. Uh, but in the end of the season, got a little tired, so we we turned her out. She came back, and she was one of those one of those uh, mares that or fillies that didn't draw well, and she just didn't have good luck on her. And then we went to Lexington, and she popped off a, a great mile, I think, behind uh, uh, another horse, and uh, hit that forty-seven and three mark, and you know that was uh, quite a memorable day. Yeah, the, the fastest horse you've owned? 147 and 3, yes. Yeah, that, that had to be exciting. Um, and Adriano, uh, how, did she, uh, how did she come to uh, be in your stable eventually and, uh, and move here north of the border? I feel like I've had this conversation with Jeff before. Uh, Jeff actually, told, when she went into the Harrisburg sale, uh, I know Jeff had mentioned it to me when I was 
you know, at the Harrisburg sale, I, I, I was coming back home and he had mentioned that this horse was in and it was pretty much the same conversation that you're hearing right now. He told me about all her bad luck. I looked her up and I was, I was looking for some race horses to, to, you know, bring back to Canada and, and race here with Richard Moreau. And I asked Richard to take a look at her and, and look at the lines. He said, she's a nice looking mare and we could probably, we could race her here. Uh, Richard had gone down. I had already come back and Richard had gone down to the sale and uh, he had, uh, we had set a price in our head of what we were going to go to. And my, my feed was a little bit delayed and uh, Richard on the, on the phone talking to me and we said, let's, let's go to, you know, 140. And at the time I, I got a message from Richard saying that we didn't get her because the, the auctioneer we we both thought that she was selling for 145 but when the hammer dropped they went to him with the with the clipboard and sure enough we had her at 140 and i only found out because my feed was a little bit delayed there and i seen the 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 auctioneer uh basically holding up a bit and i was like why is it still stuck at 140 when richard just told me over the phone we didn't get it and then sure enough the phone rang at the same time that i saw the hammer go down on on my computer and and I answered the phone with, "We got that horse, didn't we?" And he's like, "Yes, we did." And I said, "All right, that's good." But we had we had plans of buying something else if that didn't go through. But uh, that kind of lucked out for us because uh, she turned out to be fantastic when she got here. Yeah, when uh, when she came here, an immediate impact, and uh, and certainly fit in at the top level. Did she um, did she meet or exceed expectations, or, or you know what did you think you had in her when when you got her here? Right. When we got her here, it's just like, you know, it's, you know, I bought a racehorse, you know, that's, you know, you spend a lot of money sometimes, you know, I think, you know, to, to buy them, but that's the price you pay if you want to be in this game, uh, you know, and, and be at the, the higher level. And uh, when she got here, she's, she was racing really good. And she, she rolled off, I think like six in a row uh, there and, and a bunch of wins in the, in the preferred. And uh, she was racing fantastic, and it was a pretty tough field. Like, you have a lot of horses that were really good at the time here, Kendall Sealster, and then, uh, you know, a lot of horses came in from the U.S., and that um, that class is a, it was a tough class, the Mayor's Open. And, you know, and they don't go with it every week. And, and she did real well, and she made quite a bit of money, considering I've only, I only had her for uh, 11 months at the time. And, and you know, it's it was a, it was a fun run, you know, and, and she turned out to be really good. And... Uh, and she held up, and I just I absolutely love Better's Delight. So uh, Vegas Vacations, Better's Delight. I've always looked at Better's Delight babies when I go to the sale. It, that's that's my those are those are the types that I look at. And um, you know, she looked like she was the part. She was pretty big for a Better's Delight, I'll tell you. You know, so she's uh, sure. uh, you know she was fantastic for us, and she did real well. Yeah, a regular at the uh, Philly and Mare Preferred level here on the uh, WEG circuit, as you mentioned. And uh, we're going to get a look at her in action and uh, one of her many victories here at uh, Mohawk Park. And we'll take you back uh, a year or two ago now, back, uh, in fact, to uh, July of last year. And here's Kenny with the race call. They're off and pacing. First away at the rail wins Sun Glory. Speed in the center from Double A Mint. Coming away third is American Sarah. Floating out fourth, Cousin Mary. Kendall Sealster takes back into fifth now. Witch Dolly sixth. Seventh is Blackjack Pat. Early trailer Alexis Faith. Going to the quarter pole, they've got Double A Mint on point. In the pocket spot is Win Sun Glory. Length and a half in third to American Sarah. Cousin Mary continues fourth. Then it's Kendall Sealster, Witch Dolly, Blackjack Pat, and Alexis Faith. First panel 27 and 1, and the mares are into the backstretch. Leader of the pack, Double A Mint. Win Sun Glory pocket rides. American Sarah single file third. Cousin Mary is from fourth. Here she comes first over, though, as Harris steps on her gas pedal. On cover, Kendall Sealster with a golden second over tow. Witch Dolly third over now sixth. Seventh through at the rail came Alexis Faith. Trailing at the inside from an eighth is Blackjack Pat. We've got four in and four out. Past the midway point, 56 and 2. Ganging up on Double A Mint as right by went Cousin Mary. Now third, now second, Kendall Sealster. Advancing up on cover, Witch Dolly. Back into fifth is Wind Sun Glory. Sixth outside now, Blackjack Pat. Locked and shuffled American Sarah and Alexis Faith would need to sweep from last as they go to three quarters chasing new leader Kendall Sealster. 
She's cleared. She's opened up daylight. She's got three now, four. As Fillion gets busy on her at three quarters in 123, they lit it up 26 and two in that third quarter. And opening up a big lead now, Kendall Sealster. Back into second, Cousin Mary. Third, popping out his Witch Dolly. Double A Mint re rallies up on the far outside. They're in deep stretch. And it's Kendall Sealster still there, coming into the critical final eighth of the mile. Double A Mint on the outside, chasing her right to the end. Kendall Sealster, Double A Mint going to make it tight. Kendall Sealster, can she hold on? Double A Mint says no, she can't. 150 and four. Double A Mint roaring up on the far outside, looking to get there. Absolutely airborne in that final eighth of a mile, and thank goodness for that long Mohawk stretch, uh, one of uh, the many impressive wins from Double A Mint. Uh, I think I'll throw it around uh, the horn to all of you guys uh, next and uh, just uh, maybe get your thoughts. Uh, do you have a horse in the stable this year that you're, you're particularly excited about uh, watching return to action? Uh, Rob, we'll, we'll start with you. For me, it'd definitely be a quick, quick tour. He's another home. He got, got narrowly beaten in the uh, grassroots uh, final last year by Mayhem Sealster, Mayhem Hanover. And Mark, Mark likes the way he's coming back a lot. We've staked him up to everything uh, locally, North America Cup. Um, so he, he's one of the first ones we've had NA Cup eligible anyway. So hopefully he can take on the Bearcats. All right, fingers crossed with him. Uh, Jeff Davis, how about uh, yourself? Yeah, I have a couple of them. Uh, one, uh, Tempest Sealster, uh, it's an older mare. She's uh, a race raceway mare. She was killing it down in Pompano until they uh, closed. So uh, we're hoping, you know, to get her back at Hawthorne here quickly. Um, but the other one would be Fox Valley Triton. He's a was the Illinois three-year-old champion here. We all like to race uh, well at our home tracks, and that's always been important to me. Uh, he's one of the last crops of sports master, not sports writer, here in Illinois. And he won, uh, you know, for us last year with Casey Leonard and and uh, Frank, my partner, and also Pete Kuchis here from Illinois. So it was fun. Yeah, you talk about underrated stallions. Uh, I think sports master uh, ranks right up there. Uh, you know, he produced a lot of really good, hard-hitting racehorses. Yep. And Adriano, uh, now with uh, Jimmy Freight in the Stallion Shed, uh, do you have any uh, youngsters that you're excited about? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I actually, I have a few uh, two-year-olds in training. I have a, a, a nice-looking Better's Delight Colt uh, that I, I, I'm, I'm in with some partners. I bought him from the uh, from the London sale, Armour Sealster. He's with Scott McEnany's. And uh, so far, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing, uh, you know, uh, good stuff about all the horses that we have. So, I, I, But I think that that's pretty much everybody at this point. Uh, the two-year-olds all look uh, pretty decent. I have a couple of fillies with Blake McIntosh. I got a betting line uh, a filly that doesn't look so bad right now. She's, she looks pretty good, grip and win. And, uh, and a couple, uh, Louis Waugh and myself, we actually went to the London sale and we went there with the uh, the notion that we were going to buy a couple uh, babies, and we have uh, two babies together, which Louis is breaking and training. So uh, if that, uh, you know, I know he, he's just getting used to that that uh, driving thing, and if that doesn't work out for Louis Wah, maybe he can be a trainer down the road, and you know, and maybe he can uh, he'll buy out Richard and take over his farm and uh, and all the rest of that stuff, and. But I think he might have a chance as a driver, so maybe that's you know the training thing is not <laughs> is not for him. But uh, right now it seems like it's going it's going decent with them. The two Phillies look 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 all right. They're Ontario breds, and and we're pretty excited about what uh, what we have so far. Yeah, that was going to be my next question: was who's who was going to drive if he's training and part owner? <laughs> but uh, I guess we know the answer to that. Uh, we have one more trivia question to get to tonight. Uh, our final one of the evening. And uh, we want to know, this Sunday night would have marked the final of which major Canadian stakes race? Uh, kind of a, a sad a note here, but uh, unfortunately this Sunday night, it would have marked the final of which major Canadian stakes race uh, had it been uh, still scheduled to go. And uh, again, if you think you know the answer, leave it for us in the comments section and we're gonna recap 
all of the questions and answers at the end of the show, as well as our poll question. Uh, perhaps we'll bring that up uh, just one more time here, Curtis, as we uh, wind down the show and give people a, a final chance to have their say. Which of the following rules would you most like to see made universal in all jurisdictions? Uh, we gave you four options to choose from. Would it be the pylon rule, fair start rule, urging rule, or something other than that? And uh, again, we will recap the results at the end of the program as well. Uh, we want to uh, have a look at one more uh, big gun from uh, Rob's stable in recent years and uh, a trotting filly that uh, gave you big thrills, evident beauty. And uh, maybe just take us back to uh, how you got involved with her and uh, she was one of the, the top uh, fillies in racing the last couple of years. Yeah, so we raced her mother with uh, with Nifty Norman, struck by Lindy, with a explosive matter that we brought, bought in Harrisburg for 32000 I think she made almost 500000 for us and we sold her uh, to White Birch Farms and then we bought her t first two fillies. That, well, the first one was Evan Beauty. The second one uh, hasn't had the career that she's had just yet, but we're working on it. Um, so we bought her in, in Kentucky um, and the, the rest was history. She, she had a good two-year-old year and she had a fantastic three-year-old year. She disappointed in a couple of big races of Hamiltonian Oaks. She made a break and the Breeders' Crown she, the elimination. She made a break right at the wire. So was, there, was, there was some heartbreak as well, but I'm only crying out of one eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she... Uh maybe underachieved when it looked like she she should do well and then other times she surprised when she got overlooked and uh, the race we're going to look at is certainly one of those occasions now you talked about not making the trip to Trois Rivière to watch Sunfire Blue Chip because of an outside post so what were you thinking in uh, going into the elegant image final with the filly when she had post 10 against uh a great group including the heavy favorite on that night who was a filly named When Doves Cry well, the, the amount of 10 holes we drew in the summertime in stake races were, were crazy. I think Quick Tour drew the 10 hole four or five times or never drew inside the nine hole. But we were, we're only five minutes away. We, we weren't going to miss that race. <laughs> and it was a, a good thing that you did show up for that. Uh, here is another look back to that uh, electrifying, elegant image final victory uh, from just last year in mid-September. And once again, here's Kenny Middleton Good with the race call. They're off and trotting, rocketing out of there. Sister's Promise as McClure drives her to the front. Coming away down the center, Teddy's Little Angel, split by Cloud Nine Fashion, and on the far outside, the Ice Duchess marching out of there too. When Dove's Cry lays off this early speed battle early, back into fifth she goes for a lard. Sixth away from the fence is only Take Cash. Dropped over seventh when Evident Beauty. To the rail from an eighth is HP Titania Runner. Then to the outside, Princess Dale, and last is Bright Eyes M. Quarter 27, one fifth. Cloud Nine Fashion to the front, under siege from Long shot the Ice Duchess, and the Ice Duchess trots to the front past three-eighths. Back into second, Cloud Nine Fashion, Sisters Promise third, fourth, Teddy's Little Angel. Here outside from fifth comes When Doves Cry. Picking up that live cover is only Take Cash into sixth now. Seventh on the move is Evident Beauty, scooting up the rail, HP Titania Runner, then Princess Dale, trailing his Bright Eyes M, half and 55 and three, they're rolling right along here. The Ice Duchess on a two-length advantage going into the final turn. Second is Cloud Nine Fashion. When Doves cry, inching closer, third outside on a steady first over gain. Back into fourth at the rail, Sisters Promise with gold and cover. Only take cash is right there in the hunt from in fourth now, tracking her cover to the head of the stretch. And it's the Ice Duchess about to get her class tested as when Doves cry is right up alongside. In the pocket spot, third is Cloud Nine Fashion. Looks like she'd like some racetrack and off cover. Only take cash. Three quarters in 124 and one when Doves cry. Vulnerable tonight it looks as though here on the outside is only take cash taking it to her could miller get up with evident beauty on the far outside here's evident beauty rolling on the far outside evident beauty post 10 no problemo it's the elegant image final to evident beauty at nine to one as she scores in 153. When she had her A game, uh, certainly one of the very best trotting fillies in the sport and a uh, good indication of it on this night. 
Rob, you mentioned the younger sister. Uh, she had only two starts last year. Didn't really put it all together. Uh, can you give us a status report on, on how she has been looking so far in the three-year-old season? Well, yeah, Nif Nifty had her just so ready to qualify. He had her in to qualify one day, and then and she disappeared from the box. She didn't qualify that day. So, And he, and he said he was having, having a little bit of difficulty with her, so he just felt the change of barn might help her, so he moved over to Oki Swanstead. And I haven't heard uh, how she's doing since then, but as far as I know, she's doing okay. We're, we're, I liked her as a two-year-old, actually. She showed some speed, but just didn't have her head on right. I was going to say, uh, basically an attitude uh, issue at this point? Seems to be, yeah. All right, another question for all three of you as we uh, uh, get down toward the end of the uh, the show tonight. Again, thanking Adriano Sorella, Jeff Davis, and Rob Giles for joining us. Uh, I want to ask all three of you one final question. Uh, if you were to give a, a piece of advice to someone that was looking to get into horse ownership, uh, what might that be? Uh, Adriano, we'll start with you. Um, I guess, you know, uh, I think starting off slowly, you know, get in, get involved with some of the, you know, the, the good people in the business and, you know, um, maybe get a piece of a horse. And uh, sometimes it's not all about the babies and the two year olds and, and the yearlings, maybe to get into the sport and wet your feet, get into a claimer or an older race race horse, just so you can see some of that excitement because it is a, a little bit of a, it is a little bit of a of a weight for on babies, and sometimes they don't really work out. But if you get involved with race horses, you know you know what you're getting involved with, and you can uh, experience the fun with uh, you know involved with uh, other partners, trainers, or grooms, caretakers, and and, and you know it kind of helps along the way. It gets you going. You know that's that's how I started. I I got involved with race horses first, and and it got me excited and I wanted to see the development of the babies. And then I started dabbling with the babies as well. And, and that's something that, that I think everybody should have that instant gratification, um, so to speak. And I think that's, that's the way to get, get excited with the, with, you know, owning racehorses. Hey, Jeff, uh, what would you say on that topic? Well, I think, uh, you know, for uh, the person who doesn't really have, any connection or they don't know someone, uh, you got to ask a lot of questions. But for those people who don't know something, someone to ask those questions, I think what Anthony McDonald is doing with the stable is fantastic for bringing in new people. Um, the, the, the people that he's brought in and the different horses and the different levels, you can get your feet wet, get a little understanding of, of the horse business. Uh, for those who don't have a connection, for those who do and you have a connection, just find someone you can trust and, and listen to the experts and, you know, only kind of invest in what you can afford. And Rob, uh, you know, we couldn't wrap up the show without mentioning your all-time favorite horse that you've owned, uh, the uh, hard-hitting Armbro Nautilus. He was trained by Pat Hudon, so you had horses with both Joe and Pat uh, in, in previous years. And uh, you've had a wide variety of people you've been associated with. So what's, uh, you know, what's the secret, uh, in your opinion, to longevity in owning horses? Well, you absolutely have to associate with yourself with good people, people that you can trust, and, uh, and let them do their job. I don't want my trainer telling me how to sell tomatoes. I'm not going to tell them how to train their horses. So they're, they're should, they should be professionals, and you got to trust them to do the job for you. Well put. All right, on that note, uh, I think we're, we're getting set to wrap uh, things up. So let's uh, quickly recap those trivia questions uh, for you and our poll question as well. And, uh, again, thank you to everybody for tuning in tonight and uh, having your say. Our poll question, which of the following rules would you most like to see made universal in all jurisdictions? And the urging rule. Uh, came out on top in our poll, 46%. The pylon rule with 22% of the votes, uh, other getting 19, and the fair start rule with 10%. So thank you again for taking part in that. Let's recap the trivia questions. We'll see how you did. First one, asking you who the second richest performer uh, was from uh, the Sire sports writer, Jimmy Freight, being his richest performer, his second richest performer, a horse by the name of Veracity, a little over 682000 earned in his career. 
The second question, Sunfire Blue Chip posted his first major stakes victory in what race? Well, it was the 2013 Adios that came at the Meadows, a 148-3 victory and vaulted uh, this pacer on to a stellar career where he banked more than $1.6 million. And our final trivia question, this Sunday night would have marked the final of which major Canadian stakes race? And the answer was the Confederation Cup at Flamborough Downs. The four-year-old event would have been set to go this Sunday night. Unfortunately, not uh, going to happen. But uh, we can tell you that uh, that will be the theme of our upcoming show here on uh, COSA TV. We're going to do a virtual uh, look at the Confederation Cup that night. We're going to take a trip down memory lane. We've got Ken Middleton, Ken Workington, uh, former race callers at Flamborough Downs and called many Confederation Cups. Uh, hoping Gary Guy can join us as well, if available that night. And uh, also uh, an interesting twist, uh, we've got Off and Pacing uh, teaming up with us that night, uh, Ryan Clements, and he's working on putting together a virtual simulation race of a Confederation Cup that will be part of the broadcast as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's coming up uh, this Sunday night at 7.30 again on COSA TV, Confederation Cup theme to show on the night that would have been the final of that event. So again, a big thank you, uh, gentlemen, Adriano Sorella, Jeff Davis, Rob Giles. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight. And I uh, want to wish you all the best uh, this upcoming race season when we get up and running. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. And good, and good luck in, uh, in your uh, regular day jobs as well. Thank you again, gentlemen, and thank you for watching, and we will see you next time on COSA TV. COSA, the Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, proudly serving Ontario horse people with integrity and accountability. Collaborative, supportive, helping to ensure a vibrant harness racing industry, lifetime membership is free, and there are many benefits. Become a new member today. COSA, representing the interests of horse people racing at Ontario racetracks. To find out more, visit cosaonline.com.